morning. This is the scary time when I'm not quite sure anybody's there, but I'm going to go ahead nevertheless. So Janet Gorond here. I'm the founder of World Without Wine. And what I want to do this morning is to share with you seven steps to sobriety. I'm in my sixth year of sobriety, which is awesome. I've never felt better, by the way, but that's another story. What I've been doing is casting my mind back because, you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing. And I've been thinking back to what, what really helped me make that change. What were the big steps that I took that made all the difference? So I've managed to come up with seven and I'd like to share those with you during this Facebook Live in case they are useful to you. So let me start with step number one. Step number one is acceptance. What I say to people when they pitch up at the workshops is the first thing that I say to them, because they're always feeling a bit nervous and apprehensive, as you can imagine, I say to them, well done, well done for being here because they've taken the biggest and most important step of all. And that is, of course, to accept that, yes, there's a problem here. I've got a problem with alcohol. I have to accept it. And even more importantly, I have to do something about it. So that's a big one. And nothing's going to happen. And nothing is going to change until you get to that place. You have to accept that you can't drink like normal people. I used to sit at long dinners and look at these people that would have like one or two glasses of wine the entire evening. And I think, how do they do that? I can't do that. I had to spend the whole evening catching the, the eye of the wine waiter, making sure that my glass was always full. So you have to accept you can't drink normally and that moderation is not for you because uh, if you could moderate, you would moderate. You wouldn't probably be watching Facebook Lives like this. So step number one, accept that there's a problem and accept that you need to make a change. Oh, I just saw some people. Roberta, how lovely to see you again. Sandy, okay, I mustn't spend my entire Facebook Live chatting to you all. I'm going to have a big chat at the end of this, but thank you so much for, for pitching up. It makes all the difference. I'm always convinced I'm talking to myself for a while. So where were we? Acceptance. Step number one. If you don't accept there's a problem, you're not going to make any progress whatsoever. Step number two, of course, you knew this was coming, my tribe, connection. I had to accept that I couldn't do this alone. Those of you that know my story may remember that I spent 10 whole years trying to make a change on my own. I mean, I was deeply embarrassed about this issue because I knew a lot of normal people who would just have that one or two glasses of wine. And I thought there was something wrong with me. Why couldn't I be like that? So I thought, well, I'll keep very quiet about this problem that I've got so nobody will find out, but I'll just make the change on my own. So I Googled that uh, the low risk limits were a bottle and a half of wine a week. So I thought, okay, I'll drink no more than that. So I think you can imagine how that went, you know, it would never last longer than a week and then the wheels would come off and I'd be wrapped with um, regret and my self-esteem would be on the floor and again it would be, what is wrong with me? Why can't I be normal? So I had to find my tribe, I had to find other people and many of you that are watching this will be able to identify with this huge relief that I felt when I found those people. I started off looking for them at AA and that didn't quite work for me because uh, there were some lovely people there but they were certainly further down the line than I was with their drinking. There were people there that had been drinking vodka in the morning, there were people there that had lost everything. I mean I wasn't there yet by any means but I was kind of on my way. I was a very respectable functioning alcoholic at that time. So I drifted out of AA thinking oh no, what am I going to do? It was nice to hear that other people have a problem, but in a way it, it kind of scared me because I thought, oh no, you know, my, my problem's going to get as bad as this. I thought, I've got to find people like me. So eventually I found a workshop in London, a one-day workshop. I went to that workshop and it was great because not only did we pick up some tools and tips how to change our behaviours, 
but also we connected and there were people there like me, you know, they were mostly females, uh, they all had good jobs and they were drinking a bottle of wine every night and thinking really nothing of it until they realised, you know, a couple of decades later they were on a bit of a slippery slope here and they needed to get off. So it was a huge relief to meet those people and even though I never saw most of them again because I came back to South Africa, they're still on my phone and we still chat and most of us are still sober. So it makes a huge difference to find your tribe. And we've got a lovely tribe at World Without Wine. And if you're not a member yet, please check it out on our Facebook, on our website, worldwithoutwine.com and join. So step number three, well, let me recap. Step number one, accept you've got a problem. Step number two, find your tribe. Step number three, mind shift. When I got sober six years ago, the new research on willpower hadn't surfaced. So I was relying on willpower and I think that, that's why it was so difficult. But I was making a mind shift as I was getting sober. And the mind shift is about, it's about thinking about alcohol in a whole new way. The, the new research on willpower identifies the fact that it's, it's a finite resource. It will run out. I mean, it's very useful at the beginning and it has its uses, but you can't rely on it. When I was trying to moderate alone, I, I could, it would last for two weeks and then it was gone every time I tried. So willpower is a finite resource. You can't be drinking for decades and then suddenly say, okay, I'm going to use willpower, I'm going to stop drinking, because it won't work. You have to do something far more fundamental. You have to change your whole thinking around alcohol. And the way you do that is to identify your false beliefs around alcohol. I mean, mine, just to give you an example of what mine were, they were well, I can't socialise without alcohol, I can't have fun without alcohol, I can't relax without alcohol, how do I reward myself for working hard without alcohol? My subconscious was absolutely teeming with these mad ideas. So I had to turn them around, I had to turn them around intellectually first of all, think, but you know, when I was a kid I didn't need alcohol to enjoy myself, you know, in my early teens I used to be a giggly little creature, you know, and I certainly didn't need any, any booze to make that happen. So, you know, you do some deep thinking and you work it out for yourself gradually. So you have to overturn your beliefs intellectually and then you have to do it practically. You have to do the work, as we say. So I'll give you an example, uh, just one of those beliefs. My belief was I can't socialise without alcohol. But what I did to overturn that belief uh, in a practical way is I made myself socialise without alcohol. So uh, when I stopped drinking, I maintained my normal social life, which, you know, wasn't hectic, but I, I would go out once or twice a week. So I carried on doing that, but without alcohol. And I tried to treat it as a kind of scientific experience. I kept a notebook. And every time I went out, I came back and I wrote it up in my notebook. And at the beginning, <laughs> I've still got that book, at the beginning I was looking at it and it said, uh, oh God, what a long and boring evening. I just wasn't enjoying myself at all. Sometimes I would just do a runner after half an hour. But gradually you keep trying and you keep trying and you learn the social skills that you've never actually developed because you, were, you just used alcohol to give you a short cut to, to chatting. So um, after a few months, I was in a taxi coming home and I thought, oh, I had such a nice evening. And I realised I hadn't been drinking, of course, and I'd, I'd really enjoyed myself and made some great connections. And that was a huge turning point for me. And I'm not saying that every time I went out after that, it was awesome. I mean, it wasn't even when I was drinking. So um, it takes time after that, but you'll reach, you'll reach a turning point and that's, that's a huge relief. And what's happened is your subconscious has finally accepted that you can have a good time without alcohol and that's a big one. So anyone wants to learn more about that mind shift because it's, it's fundamental to the success of this journey, I believe. You need to check out The Naked Mind by Annie Grace or indeed come to one of our Zoom workshops because 
we, we build the workshop on those beliefs. Um, there is one on the 31st of October. So we've got, accept you've got a problem, find your tribe, change your thinking around alcohol. Now, step number four. Step number four, I prioritised my sobriety. I accepted that maybe I had to be miserable for as long as a year, because let's face it, I've been drinking my head off for decades. So this, this terribly deeply entrenched habit I had wasn't going to go away in five minutes. So I actually prioritised it for a year. I thought, well, even if I'm miserable for a whole year, then the rest of my life might be very different. And indeed it has been. And I wasn't miserable for a whole year, maybe a few months. <laughs> so prioritise your sobriety. If any of you have read Laura McEwan's book, which is called We Are the Luckiest, it's a pretty good book. Uh, she talks, she has a whole chapter called The Pregnancy Principle which might sound a bit weird, especially if there's any guys watching this. But uh, remember, ladies, when we were pregnant, well, we, we obviously made a priority of that, that tiny new life growing inside us. Nothing was more important. And what was cool was all our friends and our families, they treated us a bit like a princess, well, in my case anyway. And if, if I announced I was going to bed at eight o'clock at night, people would say, oh, good idea, you know, go and get some rest, be good for you and the baby. So I was protecting that new life. And if you think of your sobriety as a new life and decide that anyone or anything that doesn't fit in with your pregnancy, then uh, you don't need them in your life, certainly for the next nine months. And I love this idea and uh, I even like the kind of time frame because I think after nine months you, know, you can give birth to your sobriety and it'll survive, it'll be robust. So remember that analogy, the, the uh, pregnancy principle. And uh, I like to think of my sobriety as a rock. It's a foundation upon which the rest of my life is built. For example, if it disappeared then probably my marriage would also disappear and my relationship with my son would be damaged so it's it's a rock it's a foundation and that's what you're building during these nine months and nothing is more important than that you know in many cases you, you're probably saving your your life or certainly extending it i had an email from a lady uh, this morning who was planning to come to one of our workshops and she said i'd love to do your workshop uh, but I can't cope with it right now, you know, I can't cope with, with giving up alcohol because there's so many difficult things going on in my life. And, you know, I said to her, I didn't put pressure on her to come to the workshop by any means, but I just said, you know, it's easier to deal with these things when you're sober. Because of course, many of you know, there's many sober people in our tribe watching this, I hope. Your life doesn't become a fairy tale because you give up drinking. It still has its ups and its downs, but you've got such clarity of thought, you've got such energy, and you can cope with those problems so much easier. So where are we? We've accepted we've got a problem, we've found our tribe, we've shifted our thinking, we've prioritised our sobriety. And the next thing is um, educate yourself. I mean, I'm a great reader anyway, but uh, I think there's so much that we can learn about this journey. I mean, I've been doing this for six years and obviously because I'm running well without wine, it's, you know, I'm blogging, I'm podcasting, um, my mind is, is full of it and I'm still learning. I learn something new every week. So first of all, Google, Google alcohol and, and health. And I guarantee you'll frighten yourself to death. If you want to be really scared, just Google alcohol and cancer. You'll learn that alcohol is now linked to seven different types of cancer, particularly uh, women and breast cancer. A very small amount of wine is, there's a, a link between it. The evidence is stacking up these days. There's so much good quit lit around these days. There wasn't when I got sober. Even Claire Pooley's book wasn't out, although she was busy writing it because she was busy at that time also trying to get, uh, get sober. We've got about the same soberversary. So um, read all the quit lit you can get hold of. And of course, listen to podcasts. 
I used to listen to podcasts, there was a couple around, but there's plenty around now, including ours, of course, which is called Goodbye to Alcohol, and it features interviews with people in our community. So please have a listen to that one if you haven't. And step six. Step six, um, it's about reconfiguring your life. It's about shaking up those routines. Because let's face it, those routines haven't been working for you. In my case, my routine for a couple of decades, I would say, was go to my hectic corporate job, you know, work really, really hard, come home late, be exhausted, be hungry, but, you know, not really up for cooking a nutritious meal. So obviously just open the wine, get some snacks. And, you know, I did that for two decades. So you need to shift that routine, shake it all up. So these days, when I want to meet a friend for coffee, um, sorry, when I want to meet a friend for drinks, which is what I used to do, I meet them for coffee instead. And instead of a long boozy lunch, I go out for brunch. You know, sometimes I have brunch at the Mount Nelson and it's just awesome. And in a couple of weeks, uh, I'll be going out for an alcohol-free pairing lunch at a very nice restaurant in Cape Town with one of our tribe. So just think of other things that you can do. You know, go out for a run with uh, other people, go out for a walk. That it doesn't have to be meeting for drinks. You know, I thought that was how you socialized. You met for a drink and that was that was how it worked. And of course, the people that you meet for a drink tend to be those people that love a drink as well. So change all that. Discover your natural highs. You know, just meet, uh, meet some new people. You know, that's wonderful about our tribe. I mean, we've got people in our tribe that I never would have in a hundred years come across socially. So we've got a lovely cross-section of people and that, that is brilliant. So connect with new people and try new interests. I always say to people, just go on meetup.com and you'll be amazed by the number of hobbies and interests that people, people have. It doesn't all have to be about drinking. I always used to say my, my hobby was socialising, but of course I meant drinking with my friends. And another way that I've reconfigured my life is that I've got the, the, uh, the knack now of leaving early. If I go to something and uh, after a couple of hours, you know, people start getting a bit shrill and telling the same stories again, I just kind of slip away quietly. And most of the time, nobody even notices. So that, that's a great way to not to have to decimate your social life, carry on doing what you're doing, but just leave a bit early. I always used to be the last one to leave. I remember my poor husband saying, go on, come on, let's go now. And it would be like two o'clock in the morning and I'd be, no, no, I want to stay longer. <laughs> like a child at a party, hopeless. But I'm, I'm very different these days. Okay, quick recap. Accept this problem, find your tribe, change your thinking, prioritize your sobriety, educate yourself, reconfigure your life. And step number seven is very important. It is, I call it sit with the void. A few months into my sobriety, I felt very depressed. I felt flat, miserable. I kind of got the hang of the sobriety thing, but I thought, oh, and then I remember I used to have these dialogues with myself and say, oh, well, I'm quite old now, so I'll just stay home and read books and that'll be my life. And I suppose it's all right. I've had lots of fun in previous years. So that there's this kind of flatness. But with hindsight, that wonderful thing, hindsight, and my increased knowledge these days, I understand what was going on. And what was going on was that uh, my dopamine was on the floor. Because when our bodies rely on alcohol to make us feel good, our natural dopamine receptors, they just don't work. They get lazy. And when we stop drinking, it takes months for those receptors to come back so that we start uh, getting some natural highs, so that we start enjoying those everyday pleasures, like going for a walk and you know playing with the dog and the kids. Because uh, for a while, you know, our, our worlds shrink and all we care about is uh, alcohol-related activities. But after a, a, 
a reasonable amount of time we'll start enjoying everyday pleasures again. So what I'm saying about that flatness that you may experience, some of you might be there now, is just uh, embrace it, be curious about it, and embrace it as a good sign. It's rather an exciting time. It's even got a name for itself. It's called liminal space. And if you want to learn more about liminal space, go to my podcast interview with a lady called Libo Poulet, and she talks about it. It's absolutely fascinating. And liminal space is a kind of magical space, but it's quite difficult to cope with at first because it just feels like depression. It feels like flatness. But gradually, if you sit there with it long enough, if you get comfortable with being uncomfortable, then you'll find the magic will begin. And the way that happens is your, your creativity kind of sparks into life and you start getting all these ideas, you know, about things you want to do, people you want to meet, etc. And this, this used to happen for me when I was doing my walk at six o'clock. Rather than opening the wine, I'd go for my walk, all part of reconfiguring my life. So I'd be going for my walk and I'd start getting all these ideas and I would have to keep stopping and writing them into my phone because I didn't want to forget them. So you'll suddenly get all these ideas about things that you want to do, and places you want to go to and things you want to write about. So that's, that's the liminal space and that's when the magic will happen. And for me, that's when I got the idea to start World Without Wine. And now I'm in this awesome place where I'm be able to help other people to, to ditch the drink. And it's given me real meaning and purpose into my life. And how awesome is that? So I'm pretty much finished. Um, let me just take you through once more. Acceptance, step one. Step two, connection, find your tribe. Step three, change your thinking around alcohol, mind shift, get hold of the naked mind, come to a workshop. State four, prioritize your sobriety. Nothing is more important than your sobriety. Step five, educate yourself. Learn everything you can about this this poison called ethanol and you'll find you really won't want it in your life. Step six, reconfigure your life. Shake it all up a bit, get creative. And step seven, be prepared for the void get curious when it comes, embrace it, and then go on to experience the magic of being sober. So I think I'll stop now, because that's 22 minutes. So Roberta, so lovely to connect with you this morning, Roberta. We're gonna talk, I've emailed you. So I hope you'll come to our Zoom cafe, because our Zoom cafe is for members only. But I've invited you as a guest so you can experience it. And then I hope you'll join our tribe. Hello, Sandy. You are doing so well, Sandy. I'm so proud of you. Um, Fran. Hello, Fran and Irene. And lots of uh, <laughs> chatting from Lynette. We're, we're always for, there for each other, me and Lynette, because we alternate in doing these things. So we can both experience how nerve-wracking it is, especially the beginning when you don't know if anyone's there. So Lynette, uh, no, we, none of us could do it on our own. And it makes me sad when I think of the, the millions of people out there on their own thinking there's something wrong with them because they can't drink normally. Whereas of course there's something wrong with alcohol and there's something wrong with the way that this stuff is foisted upon us since we're teenagers and we're, we're thought to be strange without it. But um, anyway, let's not, let's not dwell on that. Um, Tina, hello Tina. Um, Try in moderation, yep. Oh, you're in Norfolk. Oh, 3.5 years sober, that's brilliant Tina, well done. Yeah, AA is not for everybody. It's great for, for some people, but maybe like me, you just weren't far enough down, down the line. But of course, moderation is pretty hopeless for most of us. Sandy says mind shifts a biggie, and uh, I'm sure she, I think she's making that mind shift now, aren't you, Sandy? Because you struggled for a long time. You were convinced you could moderate. <laughs> read, read, read. Yep. I love reading. Reframing beliefs. Absolutely cornerstone of new learning, neuroscience. Yep, we're all building new neural pathways. The best tribe and advice. Well, thank you, Marika. 
that's one of our community. If I'm not wrong, she works in the, the wine trade, so I'm always deeply impressed with people that, uh, <laughs> that are in that business and manage not to drink. Excuse me. Oh, we are the luckiest, yeah. I'm glad you like that one, Sandy. She's so cool, Laura. She's a friend of um, Holly Whitaker, you know, hip sobriety that is now called something else. <coughs> Thank you, Lynette. Yeah, I like to think of sobriety as a rock. Flick, hello, Flick. Hope to see you later at Zoom. Yeah, shaking up the routine. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you like number seven, yes. Yeah, I think that void, if, if we know about the void, we're so much more likely to be able to deal with it. Because, to be honest, I remember feeling like giving up because I thought, oh, God, you know, if this is going to be my life, I'm not sure I can handle it. So that's when people are most likely to give up. And then you hear about someone that's given up after six months and you think, why? You know, you were nearly there. But you just have to push through and push through and it's, it's really hard. But be ready for that. And, you know, the magic is on the other side and you'll get there. Whereas the very worst thing, of course, is to give up and then you have to, and then you get into trouble again and then you start again. And that's back to Claire Pooley's amazing blog, the, the Obstacle Race, which I hope you've all seen, but it stresses how exhausting it is to keep going through that early difficult bit again and again. Sit with the void. Not always equipped. Well, you're, you're getting there, Sandy. And that's why you're progressing so well now, because you, you've got the tools. Uh, the void, yes, Roberta. Um, oh, you are a darling. Yes, that's nice. <laughs> Welcome back, Roberta. I've missed you. Nobody said that to me for a long time. <laughs> okay, I'm going to end that now because that's already 26 minutes I've been rabbiting on with. So thank you so much for coming, everybody. And I'm going to see most of you at 2.30 at the Zoom Cafe. So do pop in, Roberta. I think you'll enjoy it. And we'll all love hearing your story, what you've been up to the last few years. Bye, everybody. Thanks for watching.